Thank you, Roger. I, I'm sorry that I have to, uh, that I can't stick around tonight to continue some of the fun conversations from last night. I have to interview a job candidate and teach a class tomorrow. But um, I'm here. Uh, it's an odd kind of place for me to be. I, when I was a little girl, uh, I remember my um, relatives telling me that uh, God could see me uh, no matter what, where I was and uh, knew where I was and knew what I was thinking. And I once uh, hid behind the floor to ceiling curtains and asked my aunt, can he see me now? And she insisted he could. Uh, and then when I was 14 years old, uh, my mother drowned in a swimming pool. And so I decided very early on there couldn't be a God. About 15 years later, uh, my father was struggling with melanoma. Uh, he eventually died. But during that time, I turned to Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, thinking I could get some relief uh, in reading stories of people who were going through something similar. And I found that just about every person that she wrote about uh, turned to God for relief. And so uh, I envied them. I wished I could do that. It certainly seemed like it would be less unhealthy than turning to vodka. But uh, <laughs> it just wasn't my kind of relief. And so I grew up to be uh, a psychological scientist who uh, has spent 30 years studying how we plant false beliefs and false memories in the minds of people. And so I, I, I guess I keyed in on some things like, I guess it was only 24 hours ago or so, uh, from the very first set of talks that we had, when we heard Steven Weinberg uh, say that uh, we need to wake up from the long nightmare of religious belief and anything we can do as scientists to weaken the hold of these beliefs uh, we ought to be doing. Uh, and Sam Harris talked about religious maniacs and the responsibility of science to, uh, to use that science to help correct uh, dangerous beliefs. And so I, I thought, well, I know something about beliefs and, and memories. Maybe my science could be put to this use. I don't want to get rid of all beliefs. I want Joan to be able, when she's having personal difficulties, to turn to faith if she wants to do that. But I'd like to figure out a way to, and I haven't thought about this before, to put my science to use to getting rid of dangerous beliefs. There might be a lesson in uh, another war that has occurred over the last 15 years where we have changed a lot of minds. I'm talking about 10 to 15 years ago where many psychotherapists believed that millions of people were harboring repressed memories of sexual brutalization. They were completely unaware of these experiences. And through a therapeutic process that might involve hypnosis or dream interpretation, guided imagery, uh, they uh, could lift the veil of repression, become aware of these experiences, and then be cured. And we saw thousands of individuals then coming up with these uh, allegedly repressed memories, sometimes of years of brutalization. Sometimes these individuals develop memories of being forced into satanic rituals where they had to participate in animal sacrifice and baby breeding, baby sacrifice, the works. Uh, sometimes they develop multiple personalities. Uh, and it got so that three, like three phases of Eve, uh, was not enough. You had to have a hundred personalities or several hundred in order uh, to be anybody. How did this happen? Um, well, the, the virus spread in the form of mental health professionals who started, you know, primarily in North America and then exported this, I don't know if you'd call it a meme or whatever, this set of ideas to Europe, uh, especially Britain, to Australia, New Zealand, and other parts of the world in the form of workshops and continuing education uh, programs where the psychiatrists and psychologists who were participating in this activity would then uh, teach others how to 
dig for allegedly repressed memories, and thousands of people then sued their parents and their former neighbors and their former teachers and anybody. Well, this isn't happening so much anymore in as short a period of time as 15 years. So where did, what happened? How did, how did we have such a sea change of attitude in such a short period of time? I'll, I'll tell you, you know, and I don't know if this is the answer for the dangerous religious beliefs that are leading to evil behavior, but uh, one ingredient, I think, has to do with litigation. Uh, a number of these individuals who got sucked into this process and began to believe that their parents had molested them, maybe they sued their parents or got them prosecuted, or whatever, the families got destroyed, they started to realize that their memories were false. Now, how did that happen? From the point of view of a memory scientist, it's very interesting to me how someone sheds a belief that they've held for a year or two years or five years or whatever. Um, for one thing, their insurance ran out, and so they no longer uh, were able to afford the psychotherapy uh, that was bolstering and propping up this belief system. And the group therapy that bathed them in a love bath for holding these beliefs about themselves as victims uh, ended as well. And then these retractors turned around and sued their former therapists for planting false memories. A woman in Minnesota got $2.6 million against Dr. Humanansky. Uh, several other of the patients of that particular psychiatrist also uh, recovered large sums of money. Uh, a 10.6 million dollar settlement against a psychiatrist in the hospital in Chicago where responsibility was laid for making the woman think she was a multiple personality patient and then working on her young children and making them believe that they uh, had multiple personalities requiring several years of psychiatric hospitalization. That's why that award was so big. So we don't see so much of this activity anymore. Insurance companies have explicitly said, if you do recovered memory therapy, we're not going to cover you. And so this idea has seemed to have faded away as the leaders of the, mo of the movement, one by one, found themselves on the wrong side of a lawsuit by a retractor or a retractor's family who was badly harmed by these activities. Well, my um, own work uh, in the... In, in a related area has to do with planting false beliefs and false memories. And I spent 30 years or so getting people to believe all kinds of incredible things. I and other psychological scientists who work in this area have managed to convince people that they were lost for an extended period of time in a shopping mall as a child, that they were frightened and crying and ultimately rescued. Others have convinced people they had accidents at family weddings, or they, they were attacked by a vicious animal, or they had a serious indoor or outdoor accident. Um, it's not that hard to plant false beliefs and false memories in the minds of people. And so maybe we could use some of this methodology that we've learned to get people to hold these beliefs and to act on them uh, and put these ideas to use in correcting uh, some beliefs that we might think are pretty dangerous, either taking beliefs away from people or inserting you know, new and useful and healthy beliefs. Uh, I had the pleasure of a visit um, by Alan Alda, who was doing a um, one-hour special on memory for Scientific American Frontiers. He hosts that program. He's a science buff. He loves uh, his job now because he gets to go around the world, talk to scientists everywhere. And on this occasion, he came to the University of California, Irvine, uh, and I tr tried to plant a false memory in his mind. And I want to, I, you know, in, it's an eight-minute film. It, it, it'll teach you a little bit about the, the kind of methodology that, that we use. And, and maybe then I invite you to think about whether uh, some of these uh, strategies might be developed for solving the problem, some of the problems that we are talking about here today. <laughs>